Good. So, uh, it's a ple thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. My first trip to, to Maryland. Uh, excellent. So, I want to talk about fundamental bounds on transport. So, I'll start with some motivation and then we'll start talking about, about bounds. Uh, so, let me see, where can I stand, maybe I'll stand here? All right, so, so there, there are several motivations, but the one that we're going to come start with today is, has to do with transporting condensed matter systems, also called atomic gases, but let's start with condensed matter systems. And over the last, uh, I guess, 30 years or so, there's been an accumulation of unconventional, meaning non-textbook transport regimes uh, that have presented a long-standing, I think it's fair to say, a long-standing and unresolved challenge to, to theory. And uh, one reason that may be the case is that at least some of these systems may be beyond well-established theoretical methods such as uh, the Boltzmann equation or various large N approximations uh, because all of these methods are ultimately based around the concept of a quasi-particle and uh, transport is controlled by the lifetime of that quasi-particle. Roughly, the longer the quasi-particle lives, the better the thing conducts. Okay? And so that's expressed in uh, the, Judah, the Judah formula, which relates the resistivity to the inverse of this quasi-particle lifetime. Now, there, there are some well-understood subtleties with this formula. For example, if there are small angle collisions dominate, then you have to, instead of tau, instead of directly the quasi-particle lifetime, there's a transport lifetime here. But these are all things that are well understood within, let's say, the Boltzmann equation. Okay. And so uh, the objective for today is to find uh, results on, on tra for transport that about things like the resistivity uh, that can hold with or without quasi-particles. Uh, therefore, where in particular we cannot assume without assuming that there's some formula like this that holds. Okay. Uh, so now let's talk about unconventional transport. So there are many aspects of unconventional transport. The aspect that's uh, going to be of interest today is that there's a certain similarity across different systems and across different temperature ranges. And, and so uh, it's not that t-linearity is the only interesting thing in transport, but if I only have two slides, it's, it's the thing I'm going to mention. Uh, so, so many of these unconventional materials show a t-linear resistivity in, in, in the, the most interesting regime. And something that's kind of curious about this t-linear resistivity is it tends to go over orders of magnitude of temperature in, in some cases. Okay, so for example, th these are two high temperature superconductors. And so for example, this is optimally doped LSCO. And, it, and the thing's basically linear from, I don't know, from TC at uh, and around 50 Kelvin to, you know, a thousand, until the thing melts. Okay. And similarly, there are linear and T resistivities over wide temperature ranges. And these are, there are many more recent experiments. These are some of the, some of the first ones. And then here's another, uh, VO2 has a metal, so in, it's insulating, it becomes metallic, and then the resistivity is linear, just, just all the way up. Now, a lot of these T-linear resistivities, so if you look in the textbook, uh, for example, um, Ashcroft and Merman, T-linear resistivity is supposed to come from scattering of phonons above the Debye temperature. Okay, many of these curves go straight through the Debye temperature without, without seeming to care. And in fact, they go through, especially things like this one, many different regimes where you might have expected different scattering mechanisms to, to be relevant. And so uh, the impunity, and in fact, you can apply, I, I don't know about in these materials, in, in, in some cooperates, you can apply magnetic fields and the T-linear resistivity at optimal doping just goes down to zero temperature. So to a first approximation, it's T-linear from zero to infinite temperature, okay? And, and there are many different scattering mechanisms that should be kicking in while, while that's happening. And so you would expect to see some kind of kinks, at least in the resistivity that, that, that you don't. All right, so very good. So there seems to be oblivious to the changes in scattering mechanisms from low to high temperature. Okay. And another interesting thing about these T-linear resistivities is this, it's pretty ubiquitous and they appear in the phase diagrams of many different materials in sort of at a first brush a very similar way. And so for, let's see, what do we have here? So uh, this is a cuprate, this is a nictite, this is a heavy fermion, this is organic metal, uh, and this is a, a ruthenate. And what all of these plots are showing is the exponent of the resistivity. So by which I mean, I guess everyone can see here, you, you, take, you take the log derivative of the resistivity with respect to temperature. Okay, so if resistivity was going like t to the alpha, this would be alpha, all right? So it picks up the local 
sort of a local notion of, a, of an exponent. And, and what is happening here, so all these regions that by construction are in the middle of the phase diagram, uh, so red is one, yellow is one, red is one, red is one, and this is one too, believe me. Okay, so various these phase diagrams have regions in the middle where you have things like superconductivity, and directly above that, you have these T-linear regimes going down to low temperatures, okay? And so T-linearity appears across many materials often tied up with uh, the emergence of non-trivial ordered phases at low temperatures. Okay, so again, the point of this slide is to show a certain, a certain universality in the phenomenon. Okay. So just purely logically speaking, one way Okay, so there are a bunch of things that behave the same way across many temperatures. So one possibility is that they all have the same explanation, but another, or another possibility is it, there are lots of different explanations and it's just a coincidence, but a logical perspective that lets you think about this is the, the idea of a bound. So if you're on a freeway and all the cars are going at the same speed, it's not because their engines are identical, it's because there's a speed limit. Okay, so one, one way to think about many systems behaving the same way is that they're all trying to push up against some kind of fundamental bound. Okay, and so the, the, the motivation for talking about, I mean, you could discuss bounds on transport anyway, but one, I think one possibly urgent motivation is that it's one way of thinking about why many different systems behave the same way. Okay, if for some reason there's a, they're, they're, they're trying to do the best they can, and quantum mechanics has some fundamental bound on how well they can do, okay? That, so that's the logical idea, all right? So this talk's gonna have two parts. There's gonna be a lower bound, and there's gonna be an upper bound, okay? So let's just try not to get confused. I get confused sometimes. Uh, so a lower bound on transport, I mean um, an upper bound on the resistivity, okay? So lower bound meaning transport cannot be arbitrarily bad, okay? The resistivity can't get arbitrarily high. Of course, insulators have infinite resistivity, okay? So we're gonna to have to say exactly what we mean. Now, the idea of a bound on transport is actually very old. Uh, and so let, let me, it's, it's useful to contextualize what we're gonna talk about. So historically, in, at least in, in, a, in terms of condensed matter physics, uh, the idea of bounding transport has usually been tied up with bounding the mean free path. So you take, which is of course proportional to the lifetime of the particle, right? So the mean free time. And so if we assume the Druda formula that I showed you before, bounding transport is equivalent to bounding the tau that appeared in that formula. And the tau, which is the lifetime, let me just write it down, uh, is of course related, so the mean free path is of course the velocity times, times its lifetime. And so previous ideas have said, well, there should be bounds on, on these mean free paths. And that leads to a bound on, on the resistivity. Uh, and so um, this has sort of two, in, two actually somewhat parallel incarnations, actually. There's, there's, there's the version for electrons, which has been used to bound metal, metallic transport. And the, this is associated with, it's often called the Mottioffi Regel bound. And then there's a similar bound for heat transport in insulators, where people have thought about the mean free path of phonons. And I think this goes back to Slack and uh, Phil Allen uh, em uh, emphasized this a lot uh, in, the, in, in the 90s. And, and so the idea here, essentially, that the, the, essentially that the mean free path of the quasi-particles should be uh, longer than the de Broglie wavelength of the particles, or possibly the atomic, or possibly atomic spacing. So you take some other scale that you think is important, like the interatomic spacing or the or the de Broglie wavelength, and you say, well, for the Boltzmann equation to be valid, I think that the mean free path of the particles should be much bigger than these. And you put that into the Judah form, and you get a bound on the resistivity. But these ideas are very much tied up with the concept of a quasi-particle, right? The second set of bounds, actually, that's even older, they go back to, to Thomson in the, in the 19th century, okay, is the idea of constructing a variational principle for entry production that upper bounds the resistivity. So as, as you know, the work that you do when a current, to, to push a current through the system which is in close to equilibrium related to the entry production. So that's, uh, let's see, that's the resistivity times the current squared, all right? And so uh, the resistivity is the, can everyone see it down? Yeah, I think so, right? Uh, divided by the current, the current squared. 
And then what, what these bounds do is show that they construct a variational principle for this quantity. It's essentially the statement that if you're driving a system with an electric field and, and it's dissipating, so you're in a steady state, you've got an electric field, but there's resistance, that the rate of production of entropy is minimized in those circumstances over all possible configurations. The, the, the actual path that the currents take, this was Thompson's version. So say you've got a resistor network, so Thompson's version, you've got some very complicated network of, of resistors, okay? Right? Every, every, every line has a different resistance. And then you put a voltage across here and you want to know what the resistance of the whole thing is, okay? And his statement is that the path that the current takes is the one that minimizes this quantity for a fixed voltage. Uh, yes. So, so, and then, but, that, so that gives you a variational, that gives you an upper bound. So that means that you can, you can turn it into a variational problem, right? So you can pick any, maybe you, you can't solve this, but if you can come up with a nice ansatz for what you think the current should be doing, that at least will give you an upper bound on the resistivity. Okay, yes? Uh, what's Fermat's principle? Oh, 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 for, for lights, you mean? Um, yes, yes, I think it's quite, yes, yes, because this is intrinsically dissipative. So this is really about entry, entry production. Yeah. 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 So, the, also, the current doesn't really take one path. It's, I mean, it's sort of a distribution of currents. Good. Uh, so, okay, so this is, and then actually in terms for Boltzmann, so the Boltzmann equation can also be formulated in terms of a variational principle. I think this goes back at least to Kohler, uh, but was really formalized by Zeiman in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in 1960. Okay, so, so that, that's another way of thinking about transport in terms of at least a variational principle, which naturally leads to, to bounds. Okay. Uh, so now let me talk about those bounds. So the, the first one, uh, this one, this, this sort of mean free path bound, the modulo free regal bound in a metal. So that is satisfied by conventional, conventional materials. So for example, and this is an example of what's supposed to happen. So if you turn it into units, it's sort of, it's, okay, it depends on various quantities, but it's typically around, let's say 200 micro ohms centimeter, you know, give or take. And, and so uh, what's happening here is you're taking this alloy, okay, it's a metal, right? and then you're making it dirtier, okay? So when you make something dirtier, that increases the resistivity, all right? So it's going up. And so to violate the bound, what you, the, the modulo free regal bound, you, you'd want, you, go, you have to go through this line, okay? And you think by just making it dirtier, I should be able to make the resistance just go up, right? And you do, but when you get to this bound, what happens is that the slope turns around and it goes the other way, and now it's not a metal anymore, it's an insulator, okay? And, and so, so, this is sort of the sort of thing the bound is supposed to do, the module of irregular bounds. However, uh, it just doesn't work. So for example, in a cuprate and in, and in VO2 that I showed you before, uh, the resistivity goes straight through this module of irregular bounds. Okay. Now that's not a contradiction because this whole module of irregular bound was constructed with, uh, around the idea of a quasi-particle and so one possible a likely interpretation of this is just that there are no quasi-particles. Okay? Yes? So, um, does the quasi-particle density also enter the bound? Like the uh, estimated electron density or carrier density? Not in 2D. Oh, not in 3D. So in 2D, the resistivity, yeah, right. So in, in, uh, in 2D, it, it's really, the resistivity is essentially dimensionless. And, and, and so, you know, in terms of E squares and H bars. And so in 2D, it's just given in terms of E so squared. You have a mean free path. So, right, you're bounded by, right. But, Right, so, so that's right. So, so the way these bounds go is at some point there's a KFL, yeah. and, oh. and, and, and then you sort of oh, rough. Right, but that, okay, sorry, I thought, but that cancels with, what I meant is that, I wasn't, maybe I misunderstood. In the final statement of the bounds, KFL does not appear in 2D. In 3D, it does appear. And so you, you, but in, 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 in 2D, you sort, of, you sort of say this thing is bigger than the one, essentially. And then if you write the Judah form in terms of KFs and Ls, and you, you assume that, then you get the resistivity is less than, okay, there's some E squares and H bars, but uh, let me not embarrass myself, yeah. 
so 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 the bound so this this number is is just built out of fundamental constants. Like the yes, the quantum of resistance. Yes, yes. Yeah. So you have to multiply by some interlayer spacing or something like that to, to, if you want a three D resistance. But but um, essentially it's essentially it's this. something like the de Broglie wavelength or the space in between the particles, which sounds like very different physics. Uh, absolutely, yes, that, that's right. So firstly, this, good, that's right. So modulo for regal is not a theorem. It's a set of ideas. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the difference, and indeed, dif there's indeed quite different ideas that go into how you formulate it, and also the factors of 2 pi that are up for negotiation. Uh, <laughs> but but um, these I mean, these are often actually not, not that different numerically, up, up to factors of two and, and so on. And, and so... Maybe so just accidentally it turns out... That they well, it's not, I mean, it's not, it's not totally accidental, but, 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 um, but yes, you could say from a purely theoretical point of view. It's, it's, but but um, these, these things go through all of them. Yeah. yeah okay. But, but indeed... But it's, I'm just getting, thinking about when you say that this number, at least in 2D, is something that depends only on fundamental constants. Thank you. That, that's right. That's if you use the version that makes the most sense to me, which is using L de Broglie, okay. and then that sort of cancels with KF. You sort of use, you think you think of it as some kind of uncertainty principle relation, and then it drops out. Indeed, if you want to use A, um, there could be a KF times okay. A. And so yes, the that's L de right. Broglie is um, not a thermal de Broglie wavelength, but a, uh, a Fermi de Broglie wavelength. In in the regime where most of the time that you right. care about it. Yes, that's right. I, but that's, thank you. So yeah, indeed. Another logical possibility, I mean, this bound, these bounds are definitely not theorems, and, and maybe they just don't apply. That there are quasi-particles, but for some reason, the intuition that goes into these bounds doesn't apply in yeah. those materials. That, that's definitely possible. And then you can yeah. see that for a lot of metals, at least, the uh, connection between, uh, say, lattice spacing and uh, Fermi de Broglie wavelength might be reasonable because, well, you know, assuming that each, each atom contributes an electron, which, of course, is not going to be the case in Bad metals, but <laughs> yeah, I think so. Maybe to say one more, one more thing on, on what, what is a more positive statement is that this, this, this bound sort of think of it as, trans, as dimension analysis roughly gets the resistivity right of conventional metals, but for these bad metals, it doesn't really get the physics right. Okay, so uh, you can think of these bounds as a way of trying to isolate the right physics to think about something. Okay, that, and so we're going to try to find a different way of thinking about these kind of cases. Yes. Uh, just because I think the, the bound I've heard a lot about it, but I just want to get things straight. So what about an insulator? So let's say you're lowering the temperature, the resistance is basically, I guess. Then, then this, this, this bound does not apply because you, you don't, there, there, are, there, there sort of the mean free path is not, um, sorry, the particles don't have a, a well-defined momentum is what you want to think about it. So that in an insulator, well, it depends. Okay. Let's say they're localized. Just to take an example. Then, 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 then they don't really have a, a VF and a KF anymore. Okay. So, so it just okay. right. So the idea is they sh th that when the electrons form extended states, then you then you can run this argument. Right, but for, okay. but for disordered insulators, it's a gray area because uh, yes, uh, uh, you have thermally activated Fourier carriers which have which are kind of delocalized and so on. So anyway. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I agree with that, actually. Yeah. Good. OK. So um, anyway, so we're going to want a different bound. So even if this bound is true or false, it's formulated in terms of quasi-particles, which, which I don't want to do. All right. Uh, let me just, I, I, this is a little tangential, but I just, in case anyone wants to think, I think there's an interesting question here. So the variational principles, those are theorems. So those are definitely just true, however. But to formulate a variational principle, you need to know what to vary over. Okay, and so in Thompson's version, which is classical, of course, in the 19th century, you you you, you vary over the current going the currents going through each bit of wire. Okay, that's a classical degree of freedom. In in Zeeman's version for the Boltzmann equation, you vary over all, well, um, all f of p's, all all, config, all semi classical configuration of electrons. Okay, uh, and so so. And that, those are both coarse grainings of the system. Okay, if you want to have a variational principle for entropy production, the the things you vary over should be 
should be coarse grain. They shouldn't be the exact microscopic description, otherwise there won't be any entry production. All right? So classically, or semi-classically, you know what to vary over. If you want to somehow, what I think what's lacking as is a, a fully quantum formulation of, of, of these kind of bounds, or at least to my, to my knowledge, and, and I think that would be very interesting. Okay, so if you, but to do that, the challenge is you have to find what's the right coarse graining in a, in a system without quasi-particles. Okay, so what set of degrees of freedom should you use uh, to, to formulate a variational principle? But it, I suspect it exists, but I, I don't know it. Yes? I'm sorry, it's, 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 Well, the better your variational principle is. Well, so, okay, I'm not, so for example, if you want to derive, let's say, the T squared resistivity of an electron-electron scattering, you can do it very, very quickly with the variational principle, for example. So, 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 so it, this does work. So in fact, Simon's book is pretty nice. I mean, all, all of the resistivities that you've heard of, T to the fifth, T squared, T linear, and so on, you, they, they, they're, they're much easier to calculate with a variational principle than by doing the Fermi's golden rule cal calculation. Okay, uh, right, but now let's, so, but I'm not gonna pursue this anymore. Okay, so the beginning of, of the set of ideas I'm gonna talk about today came with a, a non-quasi-particle quantum lower bound on transport that was conjectured a few years ago. So this talk's gonna have two bits. The first bit is gonna be more conjectural, but we, we will get to something more solid uh, by the end. Um, but, but for the moment, we're gonna build on conjectures. Um, and so they conjectured that the shear viscosity of the entropy density was bounded in terms of these fundamental constants. Now, the shear viscosity is really is, is just like a conductivity, okay? So a conductivity, so transport is about conserved quantities, how easy it is to move conserved quantities around, okay? So I've got some charge and I want to send it to you. How, that's the electrical conductivity that determines how easy that is. If I've got some momentum and I want to send it to you, it's the viscosity that determines how easy that is, right? You've got two plates. You, 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 in a medium, you, you, sh you move one of them this way, and then this other plate starts moving. That's because I've transferred momentum from here transversely to there, okay? So vis viscous, viscous viscosity is about the transporting transverse momentum. So it's formally, it is a conductivity, but not for the electric current, but for the momentum currents, okay? So anyway, so that, this is what they formulated. Okay, and so now this bound was, is, was supposed to be true uh, with or without quasi-particles, okay? It's supposed to just be true. And they, there were three arguments that, that they had, uh, Kofton, Son, and Sternitz. One was that when you do have quasi-particles, you can derive this in a similar way to the Moji of Irigo bounds. But the difference is that instead of using uh, time-space uncertainty, you have to use an energy-time uncertainty relation. Okay, but I'll, I won't say more about that. Secondly, what they really did, they did one non-quasi-particle calculation using uh, so-called holographic models. That was an infinite coupling, definitely non-quasi-particle regime, and it found, they found that it obeyed this bound. And so they had one, theoretical, one new theoretical data point. And thirdly, they noted that this bound held experimentally in all materials that they could think of. Okay, so this is 8 over S. Um, this doesn't matter, some temperature, and so they're, they're, okay, now, they got carried away and they actually put a specific number here with a strict inequality, and their number is probably not correct. There are, there are counterexamples to this number, okay? Uh, but so that's why I've changed it for a squiggle. But so, so they're, 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 they, were, they were here, and so this is water, this is the viscosity of water, helium, ultra-cold Fermi gases, and the quark gluon plasma are roughly, are roughly in this ballpark. Okay, yes? As I recall, when this was first brought up, uh, people were claiming that the argument was based in string theory. Now, since you've been advertised as uh, being a, uh, a reformed string theorist, can you tell us something about that? Uh, a recovering string theorist, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, so, so no, so the, the input of string theory was n not in any way to prove this, but it, it gave some, right, so, so on the space of all theories, so, no, look, so here's, you know, here's, here's, here's the coupling constant. So here's weak coupling. So these are the quasi-particle materials, or quasi-particle theories. So here you can use the Boltzmann equation, and here 
you can calculate it over S, and you'll see that it, it has to be much bigger than this bound. Okay, that's, that's point one. So what Kofton, Son, and Steinitz did using string theory was to find a few more theories out here at strong, very strong coupling that are not quasi-particle theories, and they found that they also obeyed the bound. So they, had, they were able to do what string theory, what duality, holographic duality lets you do here is do calculations in a few more toy models that could have violated the bound and didn't. Uh -huh. That was the input. But did presumably have very little to do with things like old-carbon gases or uh, uh, where at least I, I first heard of this. Um, 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 I think that's a fair statement. But okay. they're, they're quantum field theories nonetheless. They're very special ones. They're toy models. It's like saying, you know, uh, does the transverse fieldizing model have anything? You know, th there are various toy models that are solvable in physics. These are another set of toy models, and they have the feature that they don't have quasi-particles. Okay, so so that that that's the uh, that's the point. Yes. What are the uh, colored dashed lines? The colored. Uh, the so these things, I'm not sure. I think I think they're they're meant to be a, an eye to the data, I'm, but I, 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 I'm I'm actually not. I just took this. I, I, okay. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what they are. Non straight lines that, that are characterized by going I, I, okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, so okay, but th that was now. Nonetheless, this, this, so this balance, again, I think the point is not so much what it, for me, for this talk, whether the, you know, we know the prefactor, it's, it's a question about what's the right way to think about the physics and is it useful to think about the physics in terms of, in terms of this bound. Okay. So now, there were some. So this bound inspired a lot of work and, and was very influential. There, is, there are several problems uh, that by now there are some known parametric counterexamples. Okay, by parametric I mean there's a parameter that lets you go arbitrarily far below the bound, so the factors of two won't, won't save you. And it also has an entry problem in non-relativistic systems, which actually this was noted in, in the original paper. In, in fact, um, which is that if you just have many copies of the same system, like many species of fermions, like red ones, blue ones, green ones, in a, in a non-relativistic system, uh, then you can push this entropy, you can make this entropy arbitrarily large. There's just an entropy of mixing from having lots of different species. You can keep the eta constant and you can just violate this bounds. Okay? Uh, and they, they knew this uh, uh, in, 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 in 2005. Okay. Uh, so, so this bound is not, not quite right, but, but uh, it, it I want to say it, it, it has some things right, and so I want to reformulate it a little bit. So in a relativistic theory, okay, uh, where there's a speed of light, um, which is where most of, this study, mo most of these original papers were written, the bound may be formulated as a bound on momentum diffusion. Okay, so I already told you that viscosity was about transporting momentum. And so in fact, if I have, if I have some momentum here, it actually diffuses, it obeys it transverse momentum, it diffuses out. So that's, it goes from, I move this plate to this plate moving, the momentum diffuses across to that plate. And in a relative, and there's, there's always a proportionality relation between the diffusivity of momentum and the shear viscosity, okay? They're the same thing. But in a relativistic theory, the, the, the proportionality constant takes a, a specific form. It's, it's C squared, it's this thing, okay? You just have to believe me, okay? That this is something that's true. Uh, you, you can prove in a relativistic, any relativistic theory. And now, if now you see this eta over s appears naturally here. Okay. Um, I, this was known for a long time, the, this formula. And so if I use that bound on eta over s, I get a bound of diffusivity in terms of, a so velo diffusivity is a velocity times a time, squared times a time, okay? So there's a c squared, and then this is this, the time is h bar over kvt. And so now I want to propose that uh, this is the right way of thinking about this bound, okay? So as a bound on diffusivity, that diffusivity is bounded by a velocity squared times this h bar over kvt time. So I've just reformulated what they wrote for relativistic systems, okay? But now we're gonna think about what this, this speed means. Uh, and so this solves uh, the entropy problem because in non-relativistic systems, Momentum, the formula for momentum diffusion is different. It's eta over n, nm. There's no entropy, uh, and there's no entropy problem. However, the cost of that is that in a non-relativistic system, we're going to have to think a little bit about what, what c should be. Okay? And that's going to be a topic for most of the rest of this talk. Um, 
And even in relativistic cases, it may be that the velocity that you should put is not c. And in fact, we'll see that it's not c. And in that way, we'll remove some of the other counterexamples to the bound. And uh, so, OK, so a, a nice thing, and, and the final nice thing about trying to formulate the bound this way as a, as a bound on diffusion is that the time scale that appeared is this h bar over kbt, which is sometimes called the Planckian uh, time scale. Um, not to be confused with the Planck time, which is very different. Um, uh, so this, this time scale, and this has for many years been conjectured to be the fastest time possible in, in some way. Okay? And this was most, so you can find statements that affect in, in Sester's book. But most recently, this time scale appeared in a, in a so-called bound on chaos by Maldusina, Schenker, and Stanford, which is not directly related to transport. Um, but nonetheless, the, the rate at which the system can, come, can become chaotic is bounded by this time scale. Okay, so you might imagine that a bound along these lines could somehow be proven by showing that this, this, is, this is the fastest time scale. All right. But for our purposes, okay, so what, what's, what's uh, now let's try to generalize, think about how this bound might apply. So conjecture one is that there's a bound like, like this, okay, on, on any diffusivity. So, so far we're talking about momentum diffusion, but now let's think about charge diffusion in a metal. So a very nice thing about metals, uh, let, let's think about normal weakly interacting metals, is that they have a characteristic velocity, which is, which is V Fermi, degenerate metals. Okay? It's a, to my mind, it's a very non-trivial thing that there are two types of systems in nature that come with a velocity. They're relativistic systems, which have a speed of light, and they're metals, which have a VF. Okay, VF is a very emergent quantity. You have to be, you know, a temperature is below the Fermi energy. I think its existence is quite non-trivial, so let, let's try to use it. Okay, so now you might say, well, and you should say, in a non-quasi-particle metal, what do I mean by uh, VF? Okay, because there's, there's no quasi-particles, what, what's, what's the Fermi velocity? Um, okay, sorry. so beyond relativistic models, an important class of systems with a character, characteristic velocity are, are degenerate fermions. And it's an experimental fact that I do not under, that I think is a bit mysterious, is that unconventional metals such as cuprates, despite the fact that they probably don't have quasi-particles, do have a Fermi velocity that you can measure. And, and what this comes down to is, so this, for example, in angle result photo emission spectroscopy, where you're, where you're looking at the, the Green's function for the electron, what happens, what turns out that, so you, you measure the Green's function, you measure the, the dispersion of the electrons as a function of omega and k, okay? And what turns out is that if you fix, let me get this right, if you fix k and you look at omega, you see very broad dispersions, okay? And that's the lifetime. That's the fact that, they're not, that there are no quasi-particles, all right? There's, they're, 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 the excitations are very broad. But it, if you fix omega and look as a function of k, this is sometimes called a MDC in the language of uh, uh, RPs, you actually find very nice Gaussians um, uh, centered on, 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 on KF. And these, and the, and, sorry, Lorentzians. And these Lorentzians disperse in, in a quite a well-defined way. So once you can find the maximum, of a, once you have a Lorentzian, its maximum is quite well-defined, then you can follow it, and you get a dispersion. And so even though, even though the quasi-particle is, there's no quasi-particle, because the, 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 the signal is very broad in energies, okay, it's, it's quite sharp in momentum, and that allows you to follow the peak, and you can get a velocity, a velocity like that. Right? And, uh, right, so these are plots of, this is omega versus k in, in various coup rates. Doesn't, I'm not going to say anything about them, but these curves can be made. Okay, there's, no, there's an unambiguous velocity. The slope of this curve is an unambiguous velocity in a coup rate, even though they're not quasi-particles. So what, what is MDC? So what are they? Yeah. Yes, yes. So one of them means fixing. So you, you have, so you have some density plots. That's basically the strength. How many? Okay. So in RPs, you, you, sh you shine. Uh, you sh shoot a photon at the system, you kick out an electron, and you measure how many electrons you kick out as a function of the energy of the photon coming in and the angle that it comes out. And so then you make a plot, which is energy versus K. And so what, 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 and so what, you, what you actually measure 
is a, is a sort of a, dens a density plot, right? So you, you measure something like right? There'll be some some density plot, and then EDC versus MDC refers to you make a cut like this or you make a cut like that. Okay, so so if you make a, if you so what what the sort of inside of this this paper? So previous to this paper, people were mostly thinking about uh, fixing K and changing energy, and then then you get a sort of a, then you get a peak. So if you have quasi particles, you have an extremely sharp peak. This 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 plus you get will be dominated by one very sharp, essentially delta function peak, which is the electron. Okay, if the electron is very strong, quickly degraded, has a short lifetime, the peak gets broader, okay? And so, and that you see in these plots, and so these peaks become very broad to the, to the extent that you don't know where the electron is anymore. But it turns out that if you, if you fix omega and do the plot, do a cut like this as a function of k, the, the peak remains very well defined for reasons that I don't think are understood. Something going beyond just taking that plot and thinking about what the cut, because it looks like the way you drew that plot, that regardless of which way you took the, the it, it, it's cut, strange. It was broad. It, it was broad in one direction. Yeah, the thing is that it's a well-defined Lorentzian in 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 one direction. I'm told. Okay. Uh, I believe there are subtractions of backgrounds and so on, but but that that's that's the claim. Okay. Uh, but but we're going to come back to. So uh, let, let we'll we'll do better than this in a minute, but. Um, Nonetheless, to move forward, there's a, there's a candidate velocity. If I want to try to apply this formula to charge transport in a coupe rate, I have a candidate velocity to put there, which is the slope of these curves that, that were measured you know, independently. Um, but yeah, but it, it's clearly yeah, a very strange state of matter. But you, you can imagine how this happens. So, so if I have a pole, like, like um, if the dispersion is something like, so the Green's function is something like omega minus V K minus KF. I could have an imaginary part here that only depends on omega. Okay, and this can make it very broad. But if I set omega to zero, it's still, it's still well So it's a statement that this imaginary part has a non-trivial omega dependence, but this K dependence is quite simple. Okay, that, that's, that's what a formula could do. No, no, it depends on all, very much on this power. So if this power is, is uh, bigger than one, then it's very peaked. But if this power is much less than one, then it's very broad in omega. And lambda would say the power two. Two. Okay, and that would not do what you're saying. No, because uh, of course it, it gives you a very so then, as omega goes to zero, this is very small. Right. So along a fixed. Oh no, fixed. Is, omega, you'll get a sharp yeah, it's not surprising peak. that you get a sharp peak. Sorry. Right. The other no. way, you wouldn't get a broad peak. Right, no. So, so yeah. So this, this, let's say, just for the sake of argument, let's put a one-half here just, just, just for, to make an example. So this will give you something that's very hard to see a peak as a function of omega, but is a very, will have a well-defined peak as a function of k. Yeah. But if it's two as lambda says, then it should just be... Both. You'd see a, you'd see a peak yeah, in both of them. Yes. Excellent, but we'll come back to these velocities. So this motivated a, a sort of, I guess it's a second order conjecture because the conjecture based is a modification of another conjecture that diffusion in a metal uh, should, obey, should obey this, okay? So it's the same bound as before, but instead of C, I'm gonna have a VF there. And lo and behold, this, 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 uh, this will give you a T linear resistivity if you saturate this bound because there's something called the, the Einstein relation, it's sometimes called that the connectivity is the charge compressibility times the diffusivity. So in the same way that the viscosity was proportional to the momentum diffusivity, the connectivity is proportional to the charge diffusivity, okay? And this chi, when you're, when you're degenerate, so below EF, uh, is, is gonna be a constant, right? And, and so then if D if this bound is saturated, then D will go like Vf squared over T. And this is one over the resistivity. And so the resistivity is going like T. Okay. Just. So, so, right. And so 
I found that amusing. So, so you, you take this 8 over s bound, okay, which you rephrase it as a diffusivity bound, which gets rid of the, all the counterexamples. Then you apply that to charge diffusivity, changing the speed of light for the Fermi velocity. And saturating the bound then becomes that the resistivity should be linear in temperature. Okay. All right. Now, because I want to, I'm going to, yeah. Um, so this bound also has some problems. Uh, the mainly is that even though I said you could get VF um, experimentally, conceptually, a theorist is not clear what VF actually is, and so that, that's what we're going we're gonna to come to. Nonetheless, um, this bound has motivated some, some new experiments, and so I'm going to go over these very quickly because I do want to get to the last bit, which is, I think, might be the most interesting uh, for this audience. Uh, so actually, my colleague Aaron Kapoltunek actually went away and measured the diffusivity of, of thermal diffusivity of, um, of a high T superconductor. And the, okay, let me just show the nicest, the nicest data, which is not published yet. Um, so this is a cuprate, okay? And so this is, uh, this is the resistivity against temperature. And so it has, it has this T-linear regime, okay? And so, okay, I will say, I should say two things. So if you actually want to measure diffusion in a metal, charge diffusion is not the way to go because screening, Coulomb screening, means that the charge, as you know, charges don't diffuse in a metal, right? From high school, you put a lump of charge in a conductor, it just exponentially, it's exponentially gone, right? Due to screening, right? There's a story there that I'll leave aside. If you, but if you actually want to measure diffusivity, uh, thermal diffusivity is a, is a better, in a metal, thermal diffusivity is, is the way to go. And so what's happening here is you shine a laser on, on, on one point with a certain modulated frequency, and then you measure the reflectivity uh, somewhere else that's a little distance away. And it turns out there's a, the, the reflectivity will change, and there's a phase shift relative, what, there's a phase shift relative to the, to the heating laser, and that phase shift is basically proportional to the diffusivity. Okay, so it's a very nice, which is very clean, okay, because you're measuring a, a phase, right, a difference. And, and so, okay, if you solve the diffusion equation in a medium, and, and you, you, you see that you have a periodic source here, at a certain distance away, uh, the, the, there's a phase shift, okay, so you can get a diffusiv thermal diffusivity like, like this. And I find this, this really, this is a really beautiful plot. So this is, so if you look at the thermal conductivity, okay, uh, you, you don't see anything nice, all right? And the thermal conductivity, so the same way there was this Einstein relation between electrical conductivity and charge, there's the thermal conductivity is given by the specific heat times the thermal diffusivity, okay? Both kappa the connectivity and the specific heat have a non-trivial temperature dependence, okay, because the Debye the temperature is here, so that they're, they're like the specific heat sort of saturating as you go to there, okay? But if you measure diffusivity, the, the temperature dependence all cancels out and it's T-linear, okay? So the inverse diffusivity is T-linear. So that's saying that D inverse, right? So my, my bound was D goes like one over T, and so D inverse should go like T. Okay, and, and that's happening here. And furthermore, so this is the Debye temperature, okay? So, you know, this is a result about thermal diffusion that goes straight through the Debye scale as though it's just not there, which is a bit strange. Um, although, well, yeah, this is, okay. And then also furthermore, this sets on at a, roughly the same, at basically the same temperatures where the, the T-linear resistivity uh, kicks in. And um, I, I, I actually, yeah, I think this is going to be quite hard to understand from quasi-particles, but okay, I, I don't know. All right, so there's, so there's a new T-linearity in the cuprate, which is in the thermal, the thermal has to do with thermal connectivity, and to see it, the best thing to look at is the thermal diffusivity. All right, so again, one, one message from this talk is that diffusivity is a nice quantities, all right? And uh, okay, I'm going to skip another experiment. Um, Okay, so the upshot so far is that the same bound on diffusion could possibly explain both the viscosities eta going like S and resistivities well going like T. However, um, 
to make these rigorous, what, what is needed is to understand the precise conditions under which this KBT rate uh, is, is important. Okay. okay, so now I want to spend the last 15 minutes talking about a different bound, but that, that came out of these. So this is now going to be an upper bound. Okay, it's going to go the other way. All right. But where it came from was from the things that were unsatisfactory about the conjectures so far. And one of the unsatisfactory things is this, is this velocity. All right? I mean, I can say that I think I know what VF is, but as a theorist, I don't have a definition of VF. Okay? Um, and so then what happens after these papers, I, what, everything I talked about uh, so far, is that Mike Blake uh, proposed that the velocity should, that should appear in these bounds is something called the butterfly velocity that I'm going to talk about now. Okay? And the butterfly velocity is defined in any quantum system. Okay? And so the, the work I'm going to talk about now is a recent paper with my, with, uh, my ex-student Raghu, who's now in Princeton, and Tom, who is in Cornell. OK, so let's take a step back, but we're still going to talk about diffusion. So diffusion, you know, there's been a certain class of people who have been un unhappy with diffusion for a long time, and, and those are relativists. And they didn't like diffusion because diffusion is a causal. Okay, if you solve the diffusion equation, signals propagate instantaneously, and that's fine. Okay, it's clearly supposed to be a, a, a limit, but this actually led to technical difficulties in simulating numerically the quark gluon plasma, which is a finite temperature relativistic system. Okay, so it has a light cone. Okay, you cannot, you know, you can't go faster than light, but nonetheless, the quark gluon plasma has diffusion in it. All right, and so if you if you truncate the equations too quickly, you're going to get signals going too fast, right? So, because diffusion can go too fast, right? Diffusion is not a relativistic equation, all right. Now, yes? Sure, comment. On the first point, <coughs> actually, people reformulated it, the relativistic kinetic theory, which I guess some uh, former PhD from here, the lead for example, the SH. I think I meant, I probably, I don't know about, so, 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 of course, people have been simulating the quark plasma numerically so, so for a long time. And I, I just wanted to say this was an issue that, that you have to think about if, you, if you're going to do it. And, and what, um, right, um, and many of the discussions uh, typically involve modifying uh, the diffusion equation, okay? So in particular, if you add, right, so. So diffusion is something like, uh, let's get it right, uh, d squared phi dx squared d. It's going to be up to minus signs. Um, something like this, OK? And so if you add a term, some epsilon, if you had a higher derivative term in, in time, OK, that, that will, that's enough. That can restore causality, for example, OK? Um, but many of, some of, many of these discussions were, I mean, essentially uncontrolled because when, when this term becomes important, it's comparable to the other terms, but, w but then there should be even higher derivative terms that you should add, okay? Um, all right. And so I'm not going to, I don't want, I'm not going to modify uh, the diffusion equation. And so instead, I want to do something that's in the spirit of, okay, so once again, once again, this equation without this term does not have any causality properties, all right? Things can spread arbitrarily fast in space. So our bound is going to be, the spirit of the argument as follows, is the following, that um, diffusion is an effective theory, okay? It doesn't, it, it's a, uh, things, things diffuse on long wavelengths and late times, okay? And there, ca there can be, and there will be, Corrections to diffusion. Okay, uh, let me let me, sorry, let me let me start again. So it's in the spirit of effective field theory. So in effective field theory, from for example particle physics, you 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 um, you do a derivative expansion in the couplings. Okay, and and some terms would be you'd be called them irrelevant. Right. So certain interact. For example, proton decay is mediated by an irrelevant interaction, and that's why it's very rare. Okay. Now, if your effective theory has a pathology, for example, it's acausal, okay? Then you can say, well, I can live with this acausality as long as it, I can push its effects to very short distances and very fast timescales where I know 
these irrelevant operators are going to be important. Okay? So if I can push, if I said differently, I can allow an equation to be pathologi pathological as, lo as long as the pathology is outside the domain of validity of the equation. So there will be corrections. I don't know what the corrections are, but there will be corrections that I know have to restore, restore uh, order, uh, but, but I, don't, I don't care what they are exactly. Okay? So again, the, the effective theory, diffusion in this case, is, is a causal, but this will be acceptable as long as the a causality is pushed above the cutoff scale, okay, above, ab above the, the out outside the domain of validity of the theory. So let, let me, I'm going to say this again in a minute. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about causality. So nowadays, it turns out that even non-relativists have to care about causality, and that's because even non-relativistic systems have a light con and, and bounded propagation of signals from locality, okay, and this is best established for spin systems, and it goes under the name of the Lee-Robinson bound. Okay? And so uh, the Lee-Robinson bound is, is this statement, and, and what it says, so I've got an operator at some point x and some point t, and another operator at zero and zero, and I take this, this norm, okay, that's a very strong norm, it's the biggest eigenvalue of this matrix, okay, so it's a really strong bound on how different these, uh, these eigenvalues can be, and if they have to be less than some prefactors, and then this thing, which is ex an exponential with a velocity in it, all right? And so this is saying that this is time and this is space. There's a light con here such that correlations are exponentially small outside the light con. And the velocity of this light con is the Lee Robinson velocity, and it's given by this, where A, so for a lattice system, A would be the space, is the spacing between the lattice, J is the magnitude of a term in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so for example, if I've got a spin system, perhaps there's a, well, J is, is, a, is a term in one of the couplings over H bar. Okay, so this is the thing that has units of velocity. And so you could just prove this. Okay, you, you take, you write, you write down the Schrodinger equation for a lattice system, and, and you, you, you solve it, and, uh, well, you, uh, you can just, it's, not that hard, in fact, to prove, to prove this bound, okay? So even in a non-relativistic system that, that's local, um, th there's a light cone, okay? Now, the, the intuition behind this is, is quite simple. So this is your lattice. You start with an operator here, and how do you evolve operators in time? You commute them with the Hamiltonian, right? But if the Hamiltonian is local, let's say for the sake of argument that it only involves nearest neighbor couplings, just for example, then, if this operator is supported here, after you commute it with the Hamiltonian, the operator will be supported on these three sites, right? Because when you hop, when you commute it with a hopping term, the, the operator can move one, one site, but only one site. And then when you commute it again, it can grow, okay? So as you commute with the Hamiltonian, the operator grows, but it can't grow arbitrarily fast, and this velocity bounds, is, so it's an operator growth velocity, okay? If I've got a local, and it's crucial that the system's local, right? It's, because that's what, um, yeah, that's what bounds these commutators. So that the, 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 and essentially putting some equations into this picture, you get, you get straight to this bound. Okay. Yeah, everyone happy with that? That's classical, No, no, it's quantum. No, it's quantum. Yes, there's an H bar in the, in the velocity. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so what, what J is, um, what, 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 this, this, what, what essentially what J is, so if, if, say, so this is the rigorous proofs here are for spin, are for spin systems where you have finite Hilbert, you know, everything is very finite. Um, and, and basically, so you, you imagine, let's say you have only nearest neighbor terms, and so then you could have terms in the Hamiltonian like, um, I don't know, you know, SCI, SCI plus one, J one, but then maybe also there's a J two, SIX, SI plus one, Y, I don't know, any, all pos So you might imagine there are lots of couplings between different sites. This J is essentially, the, is the maximum of all of these couplings, but basically, you, you, what you, it's the sort of essentially the maximum eigenvalue of, 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 the, of the hopping matrix. Okay. The reason why I asked that question. So, yeah. Quantum 
subsystems. Uh, okay, it's conceivable. I mean, so you're saying that special relativity could be imagined. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you take some effective field theory or effective theory based on the substrate quantum structure, whether there will be an uh, emergence of the So, so, um, oh, the, um, very excellent, good. Um, two separate, so in fact, as we're about to see, so this. The effective long wavelength velocity, uh, dynamics may not be ballistic. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be, even, but this, this velocity will still be there. So this is really, this is a microscopic velocity. Of course, sometimes it could be ballistic. So for example, in, 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 so in these spin wave systems, when a symmetry is spontaneously broken, then there are, mag then there are wave, spin waves, and this is typically the velocity of the spin waves. But in other phases where it's not broken, things are diffusive, which I'm gonna come to, and so it, this velocity doesn't have to translate into an effective velocity. Of course, it's definitely conceivable that Lorentz invariance is emergent, uh, although it has been tested to quite high precision, so it's not, it's not trivial, but it could, could be, yeah. So indeed, let me, let me come to that. So, uh, okay, this is the Lee Robinson velocity. Actually, due to the shortage of time, I'm just gonna say that the butterfly velocity is a less microscopic version of the Lee Robinson velocity. And if you have any questions about that, you should talk to your colleague, Brian Swingle. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna use Lee Robinson, but it, you can probably substitute butterfly velocity also. Because I, now, let me just make the argument now, because it's very simple. So when you have diffusion, so any system, if, if it has a conserved density, like energy, momentum, transverse momentum, or charge, these will diffuse at late, you can prove that those will diffuse at late time. And so diffuse at late times means that a two-point function, of T and X, takes this form, okay? The most important thing here is this exponent, that, that's diffusion, right? That's saying that X goes like the square root of DT, right? That's, that's diffusion. But what's also important is this is not valid everywhere. So if I, if I create a huge disturbance in a system, what will, will first happen is that it will locally equilibrate, okay? Meaning it will locally reach a, a, a equilibrium temperature, but the temperatures it reaches might not be, let's talk about thermal diffusion, might not be the same everywhere. And then once it's locally equilibrated, then the temperatures, then, diff, then the temperatures will become equal through diffusion, right? There'll be temperature gradients, and those call, those, that's what caused diffusion. So diffusion happens after local equilibration, right? So first, so most excitations are not hydrodynamic, they're very microscopic. So I create a, again, if I create a huge disturbance in a system, it will exponentially relax towards equilibrium, equ exponentially fast. But once it's relaxed, then conserved charges relax more slowly, okay? Because they, they, they're, they're conserved, so they can't just decay exponentially, and then they, they diffuse and, uh, and reach equilibrium, right? So diffusion, this will only happen for conserved density at times later than a, a local equilibration time, and a distance is bigger than some local equilibration distance. Okay. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned this. So now here's the. So here we have the problem that diffusion follows this curve, right? Diffusion goes like the square root of time. That's this line. Whilst this this Lee Robinson velocity is linear. That's the light cone. All right. So and this is the a causal thing I was saying. At early times, diffusion goes outside the light cone, and that's bad. All right. Because this is a light cone. All right. Um, but however, the resolution is simple because diffusion is not true at early times. Diffusion only kicks in after you locally thermalize. Okay, so you, you reach equilibrium locally and then you equilibrate globally and that's where diffusion kicks in. And so what we clearly have to require is that this equilibration time should be, cannot be down here. Okay, because if equilibration time was down here, then it would start diffusing here and you'd be outside the light cone. But if the equilibration time is up here, then you only diffuse up here, and then you're inside the light cone, right? So, the, so the, lo the, the local equilibration time has to be bigger than this intersection points. Right? And that's simple algebra. You intersect these two curves, okay? And you require this bigger than bigger than this, and you get this bound. Now. Tau equilibrium, exactly, is local thermalization. And it is, it, that's right, so the macroscopic is given by this D. So, so, so um, 
Right. So exactly. So the way you think about it, you, the system exponentially fast tries to equilibrate everywhere, but it reaches slightly different temperatures at different points, and then diffusion equilibrates the temperature at the end. Okay. Uh, so and so you get this bound, and so now this is an upper. This has a, a not totally unrelated form to what I wrote before, except that the inequality is going uh, the other way, and and so this is an upper bound on diffusion, on diffusivity in terms of the Lee Robinson velocity. And, and the equilibration time. So these are three, in principle, separately defined quantities, as, as was just emphasized. This has to do with how fast non-conserved quantities decay. This has to do with how fast conserved quantities spread out in time. And this has to do with this, this light cone. All right. Uh, and so, so this is, I think this is the, the, I'll be like one minute, I'm almost done. Um, so in particular, in a quasi-particle system, this equilibration rate is typically the quasi-particle lifetime. Okay, that's because the collisions, even local equilibration, have, then you need collisions to locally equilibrate uh, and tau. And this velocity is typically the velocity of the quasi-particles. And, and indeed, it is true in a quasi-particle system, the diffusivity is the quasi-particle velocity squared times their lifetime. And also, this is, is the Judah formula in disguise. Okay, if I relate this to a conductivity, I'll, I'll get the Judah formula back. So I want to think of this as a generalization of the Judah formula uh, to, uh, to non-quasi-particles. To non, to, to non -quasi-particles. This formula relates transport to a relaxation time without assuming the existence of quasi-particles. So remember, in, this first, in the first slide, there was a tau. That was a single particle lifetime. So the single particle lifetime determines the connectivity. But here, there's still a lifetime that will determine. Remember, the connectivity is just proportional to d. There's still a single a, a lifetime that determines the connectivity, but it's disequilibration lifetime. Okay, I'm out of time. I just want to say that in cold atomic systems, you can measure these diffusivities. You can measure, this is going to go very far. You can measure uh, spin diffusion. You can measure a momentum diffusion. Um, you can, these are diffusivities against, against temperatures. Uh, you can also measure relaxation times, although that's tricky because these cold atomic systems are in traps and there are various sort of normal modes associated with the trap, and you have to disentangle the time scale set by the trap from the time scale of the actual system, which is not trivial. Uh, that's why there's a question mark there, but it, it's been claimed to have been done. And if you do that, you can check that these all satisfy this bound, where this V is now indeed estimated by the Fermi velocity. Okay, but so in practice, V is the Fermi velocity in these systems, uh, but it's, it, it doesn't have to be. Right? It's a well-defined quantity now. Okay, uh, and um, you know, I think I should just well, to say one more thing about T linear resistivity. Uh, in in many of these metallic systems, I'll, I'll, I'll just talk this plot. You can measure the frequency-dependent connectivity. This is called the optical connectivity. There's a peak. Okay. This peak is normally interpreted as a quasi-particle lifetime, but it's not. In fact, it's just the T thermalization. Okay, it's the, it's this, this, light, this gives you the rate at which, you, at which things decay. And so this is one of a tau, this is one of a tau equilibrium. And in fact, this thing goes like temperature is experimentally. Okay, so in, in many cuprates and so on, it is measured that tau equilibration goes like one over temperature, and therefore the resistivity is linear in temperature. All right, but let, let, me, let me stop. So, so the conclusions are that I think bounds can organize our thinking about non-quasi-particle transport. At first, we conjecture the lower bound on diffusion that was motivated, that has now motivated and is consistent with the results of new experiments in cuprates. There's a theoretical challenge here, which is really to understand when this time scale is important. And then I talked about an upper bound on diffusion in terms of the light cone velocity and a local equilibration time. And to finally to end with the challenge, uh, so the Lee Robinson velocity is best understood in spin systems. And I think it would be very interesting to understand both theoretically and experimentally better uh, the role of a non quasi particle velocity in metals. Okay, so this, this tau equilibration is clearly well defined. The Lee Robinson velocity is well defined and is probably something like VF, but it, it would be, you know, if I really want to use this formula in a metal, I should really have a way of just measuring this V, where this V should be the Lee Robinson velocity or something like it. Um, 
Okay, that's all. Thanks.